Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Pharmacy IR podcast. Um, our show today is exciting. We're going to be talking to a veterinary pharmacist, uh, so a very unique field and, and uh, profession of pharmacy. Um, our podcast is really all about looking at unique fields and careers in the profession of pharmacy, um, figuring out who qualifies for those types of jobs, what the job entails, and how to set yourself up for um, that type of work. So uh, today we have uh, Dr. Emily Sora, and she's going to be uh, talking about uh, the, the NC State Veterinary Pharmacy and her role there. Uh, so hello, welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about um, what you do at NC State. Yeah, so I am the Director of Pharmacy um, at the Veterinary Hospital at NC State. Um, and so we do a whole slew of things. Um, our pharmacy services, both our large animal and small animal hospitals, um, our exotic animal and our primary care services. Um, so we have an inpatient and outpatient role. So um, we do a lot of similar things that you would see in a human hospital. Um, we have omnisol machines and inpatient cart fills and things like that to make sure that all of our hospitalized patients have what they need. Um, doing a lot of monitoring um, and um, drug dispensing and review, um, drug information for our hospitalized patients and our health officers and residents on staff. Um, but we also have a variety of clinical services that see patients on a daily basis for outpatient appointments mm. um, and have chronic um disease states that require chronic medication. So those are our um, sort of outpatient roles, filling um, monthly prescriptions for all of those patients. Um, we do a lot of sterile and non-sterile compounding. So compounding is a huge part of veterinary pharmacy just sure. because our patients are so variable. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do a lot of non-sterile and um, some sterile compounding that includes chemotherapy for oncology patients and things like that. So that's kind of the the overview. Um, we also do a lot of teaching um, as a teaching hospital. Yeah. So we take um, both um, pharmacy students and pharmacy technology students um, and do a lot of lecturing also for our veterinary students. And so um, that's a fun part of what I do as well. So a lot of what you've already said is kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm familiar with that. Yeah. I mean, I've been I've worked in a hospital before. I, I understand, um, you know, what that might entail. What do you do things like uh, rounds as well? Is that something that kind of goes on? Yeah, definitely. It may look a little bit different because it's a teaching hospital. So a lot of the rounds are with fourth year veterinary students on rotation. So mm -hmm. our veterinary students are a little bit different from pharmacy students in that um, they do every single one of their rotations in our hospital. So they're not traveling around month to month to different rotation sites. Um, and so everything that they do on their rotation um, is kind of tailored to their education. So we have like kind of clinical rounds and patient rounds. And then there's teaching rounds where they do more mm. of like a topic discussion. Um, and so we get to do some of those and we get to hang out in rounds. Um, our residents specifically are uh, more involved in the clinical rounds than than the staff pharmacists are. Yeah, um, sure. But yeah, yeah. Cool. So what led you kind of down this path? Like what, what sparked your interest yeah. in veterinary pharmacy? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I would think most people um, that end up in veterinary pharmacy will tell you that they wanted to be a veterinarian, um, but I never had aspirations to ah. be a veterinarian. <laughs> um, I really just felt um, kind of at home. Like it it presented itself as an option to me um, vaguely and randomly as a first year pharmacy student. Mm. Um, my goal is to go to pharmacy school and then go work in a hospital. I was mm. just going to be clinical and be a hospital pharmacist. Um, but it kind of mm. like randomly appeared. Um, and then I'd spent some time in Raleigh and learned about veterinary pharmacy at NC State. Um, and the more I pursued it, the more I kind of loved it. It was a way to um, to be a specialist, but not really um, kind of specialize in one particular clinical area right. and instead specialize in a patient population, which was very drastically different. Yeah, I mean, it's a specialty, <laughs> but then within that specialty, <laughs> yeah. you've got all the other specialties. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's and then not only that, but you have like, a bunch of different <laughs> species, species. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. like triple layers of exactly yeah. it's most similar to like pediatrics where your like patient population is your patient population but then you can see really anything inside of that um but for us it's a little bit more of a challenge too because we have far less um mm. data yeah, <laughs> to yeah. guide therapy and so we kind of get to stretch our skills and also do a lot of compounding which i like yeah yeah yeah, yeah compounding is i remember Mithin Patel, who who works with you, mm -hmm. uh, I believe when he did his residency, he made some kind of compound with gummy worms yeah. or chickens <laughs> yeah. or something. Yeah. I always thought that sounded so cool. Yeah. And it's not that different than just making like trochees or any other thing. And yeah. um, we just use like an oral syringe as a um, 
as a mold and we flavor them with, I think most of our chickens like peppermint, but we've used like mealworms and other things like that. Oh, and yeah, I, that's unexpected. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Man, this is, chickens have gotten, got it pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what's the most unique compound you've made for an animal? Um, well, the gummy worms are definitely unique. Um, some, sometimes it's not the actual compound that's unique. It's like what we're using it for. Um, mm. So we've made um, allopurinol capsules for sharks with gout. So like the capsule is not that unique, but treating sharks for gout is yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, so there are um, recipes out there for suppositories for elephants that use a 60 cc syringe casing as a mold. So wow. they're like really big suppositories. <laughs> Uh, wow. So yeah, there's some stuff like that. Um, we commonly do like fluoronic gels, um, things like that, pooximers. Um, we do a pooximer bandage that um, like you puff it onto a moist kind of lesion and it creates mm. a waterproof barrier. And that's really important because our patients like to lick. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure, so, yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's so interesting to think about it from that because like you really have to be creative and like understand the species as well and like their tendencies and mm -hmm. like we all we have is a 60 cc syringe yeah. around like what i guess we can use that like yeah it's very interesting yeah. that you like you know you have to think outside the box yeah and, like you're encouraged to do that i guess if you're for sure you've got no other resources yeah. around so let's say it's a requirement of yeah. <laughs> yeah very cool yeah it's so funny though because it's like i feel like in a lot of ways pharmacists are very structured by the book what is what mm -hmm. what do the data say what information is out there and and if it's not out there it's almost like okay well i can't do it exactly but in your situation you, you, you don't have that happen. choice yeah, yeah yeah and that's a struggle i think um and the skill that i had to build mm. as a veterinary pharmacist to just kind of like kind of let go of some of that and just trust and use best knowledge out there and yeah, yeah extra label use is definitely necessary sure so, so i guess that kind of brings you back to like the type of student pharmacist or new grad who mm -hmm. would like to kind of pursue something different and, and maybe veterinary pharmacy, like yeah. sounds like having a creative kind of mindset mm -hmm. is, is certainly beneficial. Yeah. What are there, what are other aspects to, um, you know, that, that would be beneficial for someone um, who's pursuing or wants to pursue veterinary pharmacy? Yeah. Um, so someone with problem solving skills for sure. And then that kind of goes hand in hand with the creativity. But then there's also cases where like we don't have the benefit of insurance in our patients. And okay. so a lot of times our biggest barrier is just financial. And so yeah. being able to like provide some sort of therapeutic um, within a budget um, or sure. other sort of problem solving. Um, so that is definitely something that um, is a, a requirement. Um, someone who likes to continue to learn. Um, and is good at um, research and drug information, like you guys. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's um, critical. So that's, um, our residents actually run drug information center inside of our hospital, and it's not nearly as um, sophisticated as this one. <laughs> the um, <laughs> but it is a skill that they learn to develop yeah. um, in their time. Um, someone who enjoys compounding, um, that's necessary. Um, someone who, um, is in tune with legal regulations, um, and oh. staying on top of that just because it is one thing to pass your M MPJE and then another thing to be aware and mm. abide by all of the additional regulations that apply to veterinary medicine in addition to, to pharmacy. How, um, how, how different, uh, or, 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 or how, how different would you say is like MPJE, law compared to like vet laws i mean i would say i mean it's definitely different um in terms of content so like there's a lot of stuff that it would be legal veterinary medicine stuff that we don't really come into contact with but yeah. there is some overlap so like compounding for veterinary patients is um hmm. more regulated because we deal with food animals um sure. okay. and drug approval and things like that so um Compounding from API or bulk drug substances is something that we do very commonly in human medicine, but mm. um, is legally and technically um, not legal <laughs> in veterinary medicine. Yeah. Um, FDA is just um, concerned about copies of approved products, circumvention of the approval process, but mostly drug residues ending up in the food supply. So as a human safety thing. Yeah. And so, so like that's something. cow milk or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, like or this... chicken eggs or yeah. um, honey from honeybees. Is this a drug that appears on the banned list to use in food animals or food producing animals? And right. just being aware of those um, and things like that. Yeah, interesting, very cool, yeah. very cool. So, I mean, in terms of, I, I think I have a good understanding of, of the type of student that would, that would make a good fit with veterinary pharmacy. 
Um, what can folks do to kind of prepare themselves for that type of role? Like what would be yeah. um, experiences? I guess obviously working at a veterinary farm yeah. would be great, <laughs> but anything else that they can do to kind of prepare themselves for success or potentially yeah. um, residency in veterinary pharmacy? Um, yeah, so preparing for residency is a lot of the same things that you would do to prepare for human residency, like some research experience, um, professional involvement in professional organizations. Um, that was something that was really helpful for me just to um, network and become involved. And then through those conversations, um, get an idea of what day to day looks like. Hmm. Um, but then also um, I felt like it was helpful to spend some time in just a veterinary clinic, not even a veterinary pharmacy, just to kind of get familiar with the landscape and the lingo and yeah. just like the environment. Um, hmm. Students that have grown up with pets, especially like on farms or with horses, um, tend to speak the lingo and sure. <laughs> kind of do well. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are some okay. things I could think of. So it, it doesn't sound like it's a, a, a definite no when you're looking at folks that are thinking about residency and don't necessarily have veterinary pharmacy experience at, at that. Obviously, no. it helps. For sure. It definitely helps. But I think what helps the most is to help the student determine if it's a good fit for them mm -hmm. as opposed to preparing for residency. Um, our fourth year rotation in our residency is a little bit different from human specialties because veterinary pharmacy is not part of re required curriculum. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. most of our fourth year students come to us with very little experience in veterinary medicine. And so yeah. um, we're starting at a different point. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I see the residencies kind of in the same way, like you've learned all of the pharmacology and you're a proficient pharmacist and it's learning how to apply that to animal patients. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you, like, what do you think is the, the, the most challenging thing for students to kind of get or like new hires to get that's like you know in these species we do the exact opposite of what we would do in a human yeah. or, or something yeah. like that what's the most like eye-opening like hmm. difference that you, that you notice I, I think probably just the way that we use drugs because probably 90 percent of what we use are human drugs and we're using them off-label mm -hmm. um just because they're not labeled for animals <laughs> sure. um the indications aren't necessarily different all the time. Um, some of the drugs we use, we may no longer use in humans because we have better options in humans, mm. um, things like that. Um, that was a big thing for me. It's just like, I know these drugs, but then what's the difference in using them in animals? Um, mm -hmm. And thinking about like monitoring and all of that, and all of that has a price attached. And so you have to let go a little bit. <laughs> yeah, oh, um, sure. But yeah. Interesting. So in terms of preparedness, for veterinary pharmacy and residency. How many residencies are kind of out there in the US? Oh, I, yeah. I mean, That's a great question. Um, so when I was applying for residency, there was one. <laughs> wow. And now there are five residencies and six positions. Um, okay. So and they're kind of scattered across the country. And I think we'll continue to see more pop up. Mm -hmm. um, but there's one at um, Illinois, Wisconsin, Purdue, Texas A&M, um, and us. Okay. Yeah. You guys have the two. We have two yeah. positions. Everywhere else has one. Excellent. Um, there's also a fellowship, depending on the year. Um, they take a fellow every other year at UC Davis. Um, and that one's more um, with conjunction with USDA and Fair Ad for Food Animal and, and that kind of thing. So cool. It's interesting. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> very much. Very much. So I guess what, so what is, like, what's, what's next on the horizon in terms of veterinary pharmacy? Like, what, you know, obviously you're very, active i think i believe across um across the u.s with veterinary pharmacy and, yeah. and, and your role with that uh with what organization what's the svhp yes. so society of veterinary hospital pharmacists yeah so like, what's the next like what is it getting um you know more veterinary pharmacy in curricula across the yeah. u.s or is it well, what's yeah. where is, where is veterinary, veterinary pharmacy going next? That's the first thing that popped in my in my head when you asked that question um, in terms of education. So APHA has re recently recognized veterinary pharmacy as a specialty. So now I can choose it as my specialty yeah. on my APHA oh. account All right. um, instead of other. <laughs> so that's huge. Yeah. Um, and then also just passed um, the in an effort to increase veterinary pharmacy and curriculum across the board um, mm -hmm. just because pharmacists are the only healthcare professional that can um, treat animals and humans. There, that yeah. doesn't really exist for any other healthcare professional. Hmm. Um, and so we're expected to do that, especially in community pharmacy, where we're seeing a lot more animal prescriptions. Um, but 
the education wasn't required. And so it puts pharmacists at a disadvantage. And I think we're starting to recognize that. Um, and so I think teaching is going to become teaching and, and opportunities to learn about veterinary pharmacy is going to become much bigger for us. Yeah. Um, I always felt as a veterinary pharmacist, because there's so few of us um, that do what we do, that we had a responsibility to teach. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that is going to grow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we're training lots of residents and um, adding more board certified veterinary pharmacists um, every day. And so I think um, I think it's doable, but I think that's going to be a big focus in the yeah. next little bit. Well, I can definitely see that. That's that's good. That's that. There are some, aren't there some um, online courses? Yeah. Or yeah. So there are some online courses for veterinary students. Um, and there's some also some online CE um, like packages for practicing pharmacists. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What are like resources that are available right now mm -hmm. for, for folks to learn more about veterinary pharmacy, like to really yeah. get a grasp of like, do I really want to do this? Yeah. Is, like does SVHP, do they have mm -hmm. resources available to kind of educate students? Yeah. Or? So there are a couple of professional organizations that um, really value education um, and made that part of their mission. So SVHP is one of them. Um, we have a student kind of like section of our membership. Um, so you can be a student member of SVHP. Um, and we have a really um, strong and recently much larger sort of student population cool. um, and resources for students in terms of um, getting connected to mentors and um, learning about what veterinary pharmacy means. Um, and the other organization is ACVP. So it's the American College of Veterinary Pharmacists. Um, they also have a very active student sector <laughs> yeah. um, and do lots of uh, meet and greets and webinars and things like that for veterinary students interested in pursuing veterinary pharmacy or just learning about it in general. Yeah. So, yeah. What as a, as a drug information person, what about like <laughs> drug information resources that oh, are out there? I, good Plums question. is the one that I always think yep. of. Yeah. But. And I think Plums is the one that um, is most similar to our most popular human sort of veterinary drug resources. Yeah, it's like well, a monography. Human, yes. Of. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's online. Um, a lot of veterinary pharmacists across the country are constantly peer reviewing all that information to keep it up to date and adding oh. new information. Um, so that's a good one. Um, we're also really lucky at NC State to have Dr. Mark Papich, um, mm. who is a veterinarian, but a veterinary pharmacologist. Um, and mm. he has a drug reference yeah. called the Papich Handbook of Veterinary Drugs yeah. um, that's similar to Plums. And so we use that a lot as well. Okay. Um, and then other than that, um, it's mostly just published studies published. and yeah. yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. 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 I know that that's got to make it um, pretty challenging. I mean, you're yeah. doing a lot of PubMed searching and I mean, at least like, you know, I, I imagine most of the data that you're using are pre-clinical studies for, for humans, I, I imagine. You know, I or thought no. that too. Oh. Um, and I use that sometimes, but it's not nearly as prevalent. It's like that sort of like drug study, like lab mice kind of research. Yeah. Um, it's not something that I use nearly as much as I thought I would. Yeah. Um, mostly just because it doesn't always apply to different species and the pathophysiology is different. Sure. Um, and so sometimes I find it easier to consider that um, mm. and how the drug is metabolized and, and in different GI systems and what we would consider. Um, and a lot of times what we're doing is compounding. And mm. so a pharmacist already has a compounding background to know mm -hmm. how to come up with a formulation, um, determine beyond use stating and stability and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And so we can use that as well in yeah. terms of just compounding data. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's so. I mean, but I, I mean, I guess that there are like whale studies out there or shark studies I somewhere. Mean, there are a few, or... <laughs> but there's certainly not <laughs> many. Just not enough <laughs> yeah. to really like be like. I guess I'll go to PubMed. Yeah. And you know, one out of ninety nine times you'll yeah. find something. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very cool. So it's very application based. I mean, yeah. You, you, you need to be able to apply the knowledge that you that you have with the drugs mm -hmm. and, and how they affect the body. You've got to be uh, interested in compounding. Yeah. And, and yeah. Interesting. Very cool. Um, anything else that you want to say to the world before oh, we, gosh. we close up shop? What else would I say? Yeah. Um, no. I mean, we've talked about the teaching and the preparation and what a day to day looks like. Um, I think within veterinary pharmacy, a lot of people um, still can specialize, which is mm -hmm. um, maybe something else that we'll see down the road in yeah. the future. Um, we have one pharmacist um, who's actually a Campbell graduate who did a residency with us and now is our like exclusively large animal pharmacist. So she does 
Mm -hmm. um, equine and farm animal um, specifically. Um, and so we rely on her pretty heavily for, for that hospital. Um, another thing that um, future veterinary pharmacists might be interested in is compounding specifically. So in a compounding pharmacy that acts more like um, the community version of a veterinary pharmacist. Sure. Um, and then, you know, the teaching, um, anyone interested in industry um, could learn a lot from veterinary pharmacy for the reasons that you're saying, like animal drug studies, um, but then animal use in human drug studies and things like right. that. Um, and so through like NIH um, has veterinary pharmacist, um, and then all of our drug companies <laughs> sure, um, yes. could have veterinary pharmacists on staff. Um, and then regulatory bodies. So FDA has a center for veterinary medicine. So um, veterinary pharmacists are at FDA. Um, mm. And so there's kind of a variety of, um, I guess, specialties within veterinary pharmacy, but also just practice sites. Yeah. So, well, that's yeah. so interesting to hear about in terms of like, just, it seems like there's a growing, there's, there are growing opportunities yeah. for veterinary pharmacy and um, really, yeah, just really interesting to see like <laughs> the amount of compounding that you guys, that you guys are doing too, yeah. in terms of like the importance with that. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I should have guessed that 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 would be a major thing, but I'm not sure why it doesn't it didn't necessarily come to mind as like one of the major yeah. components. But yeah. certainly, yeah, I can yeah. see that. Yeah, I mean, we don't really think about it as much in human medicine, mm -hmm. um, but for us, we it's most of the time the not most of the time. Sometimes the only option that we have. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much yeah. for coming on today. No, thank you. I enjoy learning about veterinary <laughs> pharmacy and getting to know you and yeah. speaking with you. So yeah, this was fun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that's all for today's show. Uh, we will see you next time on the Pharmacy IR podcast.